gum pads. At the clinic today, I met a high-spirited neo mama, completely new and clueless about parenthood. As she looked quite inquisitive, I talked about her concerns and questions about oral care and hygiene for her baby. Infants cannot be treated as miniature adults. The dental arch of these little munchkins is called a gum pad and its characteristics differ from those of an adult. As dentition develops, the dental arches grow to accommodate the developing teeth until all the permanent teeth completely erupt and attain their position in the arch. Meanwhile, the occlusion or the contact between teeth also changes significantly. The term occlusion is defined as the relationship between all the components of the masticatory system in normal function, dysfunction, and parafunction. The development of occlusion takes place in four stages. The pre-dentate, the deciduous dentition, the mixed dentition, and the permanent dentition stage. In this video, we are going to learn about the pre-dentate or gum pad stage. This is the period soon after birth and at this point, the infant is completely edentulous. The alveolar process at the time of birth is called the gum pad. What does a healthy gum pad look like? It is pink in color, firm in consistency and definite in form. The oral cavity comprises a pair of gum pads, the upper or maxillary gum pad and the lower or mandibular gum pad. They develop as the labiobuccal and the lingual parts, separated by the dental groove. They are further divided vertically into 10 cranberry-like segments, each by the transverse grooves. They correspond to unerupted deciduous teeth. The most prominent is the lateral sulcus, the groove between the deciduous canine and the deciduous first molar segments, which determines the relationship between upper and lower gum pads at an early age. The upper and lower gum pads are like fraternal twins who differ in their external appearance. Let us take a look at each of them in detail. The upper gum pad is shaped like a horseshoe and much wider compared to the lower one. It is in close contact with the palate and is separated from it by the gingival groove. The dental groove here originates in this incisive papilla region and extends backward up to the canine region to reach the molar region. The lower gum pad differs from the upper. It is U-shaped and its anterior portion flips out labially. The gingival groove separates the gum pad from the floor of the mouth. The dental groove runs from the midline of the mandible backward and laterally to join the gingival groove in the canine region. One thing common to both gum pads is that the pattern of growth is in a transverse plane and a labiolingual direction. At birth, the width of the gum pads is inadequate to accommodate all the incisors. As they proliferate over the first year, they accommodate the teeth. Now that we have discussed the gum pads individually, let us put them together in their position. At rest, the two gum pads come in contact only at the first primary molar area. The anterior segments of the upper and lower gum pad do not occlude, creating a space between them, occupied by the tongue during swallowing. This is called the infantile open bite. The upper gum pad is wider than the lower one, therefore on contact, it completely overlaps the lower gum pad, giving an appearance of a prognathic maxilla, while the mandible 
appears retrogenetic. The mandible can move only vertically at this stage and lateral movements are absent. These mark the characteristic features of the pre-dentate stage. Are you wondering how all these signs of malocclusion are considered normal at this stage? Do not be bamboozled. They are self-correcting anomalies, which means these features get corrected by themselves as normal growth of the orofacial structures occurs. Upon failure in correction, they remain as anomalies. Let us get into the clinical significance. The anterior open bite makes space for the tongue to take its position during suckling. Therefore, it helps the infant create a high negative pressure to draw the milk. At this point, the child has an infantile swallow pattern. As the child is weaned off from liquids to solids by the age of 2 to 4 years, the infantile swallow transforms to an adult swallow pattern. The open bite gets corrected as the primary maxillary incisors erupt, creating an overjet and an overbite. Next on the list is the wider upper arch. The complete overlap of the maxillary gum pads over the mandible also provides an efficient way of squeezing in milk as they create a complete barrier in the oral cavity. This action of squeezing and swallowing occurs simultaneously. Finally, let's talk about the reason for the mandibular retrogenathia. To accommodate itself in the womb, the fetus is positioned such that its head is bent downwards, which causes the mandible to be slightly retrogenathic at birth. As the child attains normal growth, this self-corrects. So far, we have discussed the alveolar processes without teeth. But what if the teeth are present at birth or erupt too soon? Although infants are edentulous at birth, it is not uncommon for them to be born with one or two teeth. These are called the natal teeth. Teeth that erupt within the first 30 days of life are called neonatal teeth. Natal teeth are more common than neonatal ones. The most common teeth to erupt are the mandibular incisors. Their etiology is usually unknown, but could be a familial tendency. They are usually seen in variable shapes and sizes, ranging from small to conical, and may also resemble normal teeth. The appearance of these teeth depends on the degree of maturity, but most often they are loose, small, discoloured and hypoplastic. The majority of natal teeth may exhibit brown to yellowish or whitish to opaque colour. These teeth may cause feeding problems to the mother and can be removed if mobile or pose a risk of aspiration. A major complication of natal or neonatal teeth is ulceration on the ventral surface of the tongue caused by the tooth's sharp incisal edge. This condition is also known as Riga Fede disease or syndrome. Other syndromes associated with premature eruptions are ectodermal dysplasia, craniofacial dysostosis, chondroectodermal dysplasia, Pierre Robin syndrome, Down's syndrome, etc. Did you know? Environmental factors could play an important role in the eruption of neonatal teeth. The most common environmental pollutants are toxic, polyhalogenated, aromatic hydrocarbons, such as polychlorinated biphenyls polychlorinated dibenzodioxins and dibenzofurans. Gum pads must be cared for even before the first primary teeth erupt. 
They need not be brushed, but can be wiped with a small piece of gauze or a soft cloth after feeding to prevent the accumulation of bacteria on the gum pads. They say the world seems brighter when you see a baby smile, especially when it is a toothless grin. In the next video, we will continue with the description of primary dentition. We hope you had fun learning with us. Pop quiz.